So let me start with a slide that, to introduce myself a little bit. So in fact, uh, it's a very, very long time ago. I studied mathematics and physics at the University of Karlsruhe, actually to become a high school teacher. Now, something very strange happened when I finished my studies. And that was that at that moment in Germany, in fact, there were too many teachers. And since I liked the life of a student, I decided to go on and do a doctoral uh, uh, studies and doc uh, as a doctoral student in physics. And like this, I came to CERN. Then I got my PhD at, from the University of Karlsruhe uh, from the work that I did at CERN. And actually, I then stayed there and I worked on in the accelerator field. So first on linear accelerators, later accelerator control, and then beam, beam diagnostics. And uh, finally, the last five years or so, I was responsible for the diagnostics for LINAC4. So that's a combination of linear accelerators and beam diagnostics. Well, when I just arrived at, at CERN, I think I was 24 years old or something like that. I took part in a CERN technical training course on something that is called microprocessors. Well, I say it like this because uh, in the, the beginning of the 1980s, this was something which, is total, which was totally new and a really exciting technology. So I did this course, and at the end of the course, I was actually asked by the, uh, by the lecturers if I would uh, accept to help and participate in a course on microprocessors, now this time as uh, a tutor. So this course it was a microprocessor course for physicists and engineers for the developing world at the Abdus Salam ICTP in Trieste. And I accepted to do that without knowing what that would mean for, the, for the, uh, the rest of my life, actually. So it was Professor Salam himself who initiated the course. And this course was so successful that it was pursued and continually updated for more than 30 years. So you see, I was in this course for more than 30 years. And uh, after some time, I mean, people learned that I was doing this teaching. And then I was asked to, for different other courses. So I took part in the Sun Accelerator School, in the US Particle Accelerator School. And I was also three times at the ASP, actually teaching uh, beam diagnostics. Now, the, the, the computers, they changed enormously over, over my lifetime. In fact, when I was an grad, undergraduate student, the first computer that I used was a mainframe machine at the university, which costed several hundred, uh, several hundred thousand US dollars, if not more than a million. Then as a doctoral student, we had mini computers, as the one that you see here on the right, which is a, a PDP-11. So actually, this was the machine that we were using. And typically, this uh, machine was, was mounted in a rack. And the cost was about 80,000 80, US dollars. Now, this thing used a 16-bit CPU, had about 120 k bytes of RAM. Now, for you today, this sounds pretty ridiculous. But anyway, it had an enormous hard disk for that time, 600 megabytes of hard disk. And otherwise, it had a, ser a serial terminal and a KMAC interface. Now, this is uh, the instrumentation bus that was used to control the in entire linear accelerator that we, that we were using. And then came the microprocessors. So this was the, actually the machine that I was using during the course. It's a Motorola 6800. And it came out in the end 1970s, early 1980s. And in fact, was a very, very simple device. So it's an 8-bit CPU running at 1 megahertz. And uh, there was no memory or interfaces on it. But the pins that you see here, so this was a 40-pin package, these pins, there were actually data lines and address lines and a few control lines. And with these, you put interface memory and I.O. interfaces. The typical price of such a chip, just the single chip, the CPU itself, was when it came out 176 US dollars. 
And what we were using was a small development board, which they sold for about 300. And that one got, now this seems really, really strange, but it had 256 bytes. I'm not talking kilobytes, I'm not talking megabytes, it's actually bytes of RAM, that was all. Two kilobytes of EEPROM and a serial and a parallel port. And it had a keyboard to, to type in some, uh, some code, for example. Now programming was done in assembly language or even in straight machine code. So what we did during the very first courses was that we were our own assembler. So we had a, a table with the assembly code on one hand and the machine code on the other, and we did the translation ourselves, and then we typed in the machine code. Of course, there was no such thing like internet uh, on such a machine. Well, now let's compare it to the microcontroller I use today. Now, this is a controller that I will talk about in the next lecture, so in a week's time. And it's a 32-bit CPU, it's an ESP32 VR over. It has a dual core 32-bit CPU, 520 kilobytes of SRAM and 8 megabytes of serial RAM, 4 megabytes flash, plenty of interfaces, I2C, I2S, SPI, general purpose I.O. It has got an ADC, it has a, on a, a duck, and all this is on the chip itself. It can run from a battery. It has a Wi-Fi interface, so it has net, network interface. It has Bluetooth, and the cost of the, the whole board, no, I'm not talking about the chip, I'm talking the whole board now, is five euros and 52. So you see the difference that, uh, well, the, the improvement that has been made over the last 30 years or so. Now, for the course in Trieste, one thing that we did was uh, to actually try and take the very best students that we had and integrate them as lecturers into the course. And here you see a group photo of one of the courses. This was in the 1990s, okay? Now, actually, we had the, the course in Trieste was biannual. And uh, in the off years, the, we had regional colleges in, in all sorts of different uh, developing countries. Now, this course here was in Ghana, actually. And um, okay, and what, and what you see here now is, is the group. And you see already that it's, it's quite, uh, quite colorful, right? So this guy here is from the ICTP. He is a British living in, in, uh, in Turkey. Now, this guy will talk a bit, a bit more. He was actually organizing it in Ghana. This is Nick Weiner. I'll talk a bit in the, next, in the next slide. He is from Algeria. He is a Chinese from, uh, from Malaysia. And this was me about 30 years ago, right? Okay, so this gentleman here, he actually did his studies in the US. And uh, he was working with digital equipment for quite a few years on, on the development of the wax machine. But at a certain moment, he decided, I want to go back to Ghana and try to help my country. And uh, he then set up a network company in Ghana. And you see, 30 years later, he's, he was very, very successful. And you even find him in Wikipedia. So he is um, now a professor in, uh, at, at Cape Coast. He still runs his own company. And he's extremely well known in all of West Africa for his, uh, for his work in developing, in developing telecommunications and the internet in Africa. Okay. So me, we, we stayed in well, very loose contact, I would say. So from time to time, we had email exchange. From time to time, we had a Skype call. And uh, one day, uh, Ni called me. And he asked me if I would be willing to come to Cape Coast for, let's say, three weeks or so to help you on the university set up a course on embedded systems. And I told him, well, three weeks should be not a problem. I could do that. Then he said, well, it would be better if you came for six weeks. Uh, OK, well, that's still a different story. But anyway, even that would be probably be possible. And then he said, no, well, if possible, come for a whole semester, come for four months. 
and uh, try to set up uh, a lab there and try to run the course at the at Cape Coast. Well, there I said I better talk to my wife before because I don't want to get divorced because of that. So she accepted. She accepted, and so this here was the deal. I should provide the embedded systems lab with 15 experimental stations, two hours of lectures per week, four hours of practical sessions per week. And the university provides the course material, the lab hardware, PCs, internet infrastructure, and so on, pays the flight and living expenses, and provides housing. Okay. And what was very important to me, I asked that at least one local lecturer would be freed to work with me on the course. So the idea was that this lecturer would actually know everything about the course, know everything about the lab, and he would continue to further development of the lab and the course after my departure. So sustainability was one of the major goals of, of, this, uh, of this course. Now, the goal, as I said, 15 students should be able to work on development software. We should have about 12 experiments for 12 weeks with exercise sheets and working solutions. And again, because of sustainability, you want to have the documentation of the whole course on the web with easy possibility of extension. We should have lecture slides, exercise sheets, solutions that can be downloaded and executed in the hardware. Description of all the sensors, the actuators, the data sheets, of the interface sheets, and so on and so on. And of course, then the final examination, and if possible, transmission of knowledge to local lecturers. So the first thing that I had to do is to think about hardware and software. So which hardware should be used for the course, and how much would it cost? So I had a look at the, at the market that uh, at that moment and I found there were essentially two contenders. The first one is the so-called Arduino, which is uh, what was originally, de originally developed in Italy. And the second one is the Raspberry Pi. Now, if you have a look at the Arduino, well, the Arduino is essentially a standardized software development system. So it's an integrated development environment or IDE that runs on any PC, Windows and Linux, and it also runs on the Mac. It uses its own dialect of C++ for programming, and it works for a number of hardware platforms. So the first one, and this is probably still the most popular in, uh, in the Arduino, is the Atmel AVR processors. Then there are STM32 STM from SP, or this is again the SPS32, which we'll see in the next lecture from a company, a Chinese company called Espressis. Now the Arduino are extremely popular in universities and the hobbyist market. Hardware is very, very cheap. So typically a CPU card costs well less than 10 US dollars. Drivers for plenty of sensors and actuators are available, so you can easily download them and run them. And they also use some, what they call, plug-on shields. So these are so small PCBs that you can plug onto the baseboard, so the, the processor board. Okay. Now, you will see one of these uh, shields just in a minute. Now, the Arduino also has a few disadvantages. Now, the first one is it's programmed in this specific C++ dialect, and you can only program it like this. And uh, then it's only cross compilation is, that is possible. So you have to actually compile your programs, develop and compile your programs on a PC, and then download it to the Arduino and flash it, and only then you can run it. Internet access on the baseboard is not available, but you have again, additional shields, so an Ethernet shield or a Wi-Fi shield that allows you to have internet access. There's no such thing like a hard disk or equivalent, and the AVR boards at least have rather limited resources. So computing power is limited, RAM and flash are pretty limited. This is how it looks like. So here you see the Arduino Uno. 
Now, this one here is an interface for not as it looks like in the first sight of uh, Ethernet, but it's a, it's a USB interface. This is power, but it can also get power from the USB interface. And these here are two uh, rows of, of pins where you can interface external hardware to. Now, how it looks like from the software point of view, this you see on the right hand side. So this is a typical simple example running a thermal motor. So you see there are, there are it's, a C it's a C++ type language, which has a setup part, which you see here. Now this was the initialization. And then as usually is the case on in embedded systems, we have an endless loop. So a loop that runs forever. And in this loop, then actually the control of the thermal motor is done. Here you have a few uh, buttons, tools, for example, that allow you to, well, these buttons will allow you to compile, and this one will allow you to download to the Arduino board. Now, this is one of the typical shields that you would have. So you see this one, these pins here, they fit, they fit exactly on these pins here. So you can actually sandwich the, uh, this board onto the baseboard. Now, this one is actually also quite nice for teaching because you have uh, plenty of, of small devices already on board. You have a buzzer, you have got a, a display, you have got a bunch of LEDs, you have got uh, push buttons, you have got a potentiometer that is connected to an ATC and so on. So you can run plenty of different small programs to actually make this device here work. Now, the second contender is the Raspberry Pi. Now, as in contrast to the, um, to the Arduino, this has extremely powerful hardware. Internet is already built on the baseboard, Ethernet and Wi-Fi. Now, this one runs a Linux operating system, so it's actually a full-blown standalone computer. All it needs is a screen, keyboard, and a mouse, and the interfaces are actually there. So if you take this little board, you connect the screen, a keyboard, the mouse, and an SD card, then you can run the Raspberry Pi as a standalone computer. Again, Raspberry Pi is very popular. About 10, probably now it's more like 20 million units have been sold. And you have a good support in the user community, which is very important. Now, the disadvantages is that not all drivers are available. Uh, at least not for all programming languages. And the price is substantially higher. So if you go for Raspberry Pi, you have to think about, let's say 80 to 100 US dollars or so per station. Now, we decided in the end to go for the higher priced uh, Raspberry Pi because of its better performance and because of its standard use of standard languages. And we decided to go for C, as the course language. Now, in addition to the system board, we acquired a kit with 37 sensors and actuators. I will show you uh, an image of that in a second. A stepping motor and its controller, an ADC, analog to digital converter. There's no ADC on the Raspberry Pi. There is one, a 10-bit ADC on the Arduino. Then we have a DAC, which we bought in addition. And then some sensors that allow you to measure the atmospheric pressure, that allow you to measure humidity and uh, air humidity and uh, temperature. And then last but not least, we have a two-line LCD display where you can print out some, uh, some information on, for example, measurements that you did with the ADC or with one of the sensors. We also bought a few Arduinos because they are really, they are pretty cheap. And these we use for students' projects. Now, this is how the uh, Raspberry Pi looks like. Let me see if I can displace this a little, yeah. So here you have the processor. Now this one is a quad core. So four CPUs, 1.2 uh, gigahertz Broadcom CPU, 16 bit, uh, it's a 16 bit ARM CPU has one gigabyte of RAM, Ethernet, Wi-Fi on board. It has four USB ports. So these are two and these are two USB ports. 
This one here is the Ethernet interface. It has full-sized HDMI, HDMI, so here you can connect your, your screen if you want. This one is the camera interface. And then what you don't see here, somewhere beyond here, you have got an SD connector. And on that one, you will have your operating system. And finally, what's very important is this, this bit here. Now, this is a 40-pin 40 40 pin connector on which you find general purpose I.O. pins, SPI, this is the serial peripheral interface, and an I2C bus, it's an instrumentation bus, which allows you to connect to, ex to external hardware. This is how it will look like. So here you have got the, the CPU board. This connector connects to this thing here, which is called the coupler. This one you plug into uh, a breadboard, and then you can put your electronics here on the breadboard, and you can, can connect it over these pins here to your Raspberry Pi. I knew that we bought a, a sensor kit, and this is the sensor kit here, so you see all the different devices that are available. So you have a joystick, you have a relay, you have LEDs to, that you can, well, actually, even RGB, so red, blue, red, green, and blue LEDs. Now, this is an LED that you find in LED rings, for example. You have two types of buzzers. You have a, a rotary encoder. You have a photoresistor. You have plenty of stuff. And you can imagine that even if you want to write one program for each of these uh, of these uh, little cards here, it will not, the, the, the course will not uh, be enough to actually do all that. Now, in addition, we bought these guys here. So this is the two-line display. And it has got an I2C interface. So we have only four cables that go to the, to the breadboard and need to be connected to the, to the uh, Raspberry Pi. Then we have got here a, a stepping motor and its controller. So this is also quite nice because you can actually see, the students can actually see how the motor is turning to make it turn forward, backward, slow, fast, and so on. This one is an ADC, an external ADC. It's own, I think it's only an 8-bit ADC, this one. And there are a few devices, again, a potentiometer and a light detector, which are on the, this little board already, so you can read out. These are connected to the ADC, and then you can read out the ADC. And this one is the barometric uh, pressure sensor, which allows you to measure the uh, atmospheric pressure and temperature. We also bought a very cheap oscilloscope. So because I know that uh, instruments are really on the rare side on, in African universities. Now, this thing here will cost you about 50 euros. It's a 20 megahertz. Uh, it's an oscilloscope with 20 megahertz bandwidth. And uh, everything, but as, as you see here, I say the $50, including two probes, actually. Okay. It only has DC coupling, but for what we need in our computing stuff, this is actually largely enough. And this is how it will look like. Now, let me show you once more. This thing here is connected here, you see, with a USB uh, connector to a PC. And then you have a program running on the PC, which actually does the oscilloscope display. Now back to the course. The course layout is, was the following. We started with an introduction about explaining what we wanted to do during the course. Then we talked about Linux operating system and its basic commands. Now this you can do on the PC, having a Linux PC, or you can do it on the Raspberry Pi. Then I did an introduction to C programming, actually during two lectures. Then we talked about development tools. So what, uh, what are the programs that are used to actually develop our programs for the Raspberry Pi, for the different sensors, and so on? Then you have one lecture to bring, to bring the Raspberry Pi to life. So we actually to boot it, to set everything up, boot it. Then we have a lecture on accessing the real world. So there we just made a, an LED blink. So that is the, the simplest possible program that you can have to access external devices. Then we have something to measure temperature and humidity. And this 
together with the barometric, sensor, uh, barometric uh, pressure sensor, you can make a very nice and tiny uh, meteorological station. And so you can see and, and keep the, uh, the temperatures, humidity, and atmospheric pressure. And you can see its development over several days or weeks, if you want. Then we had one lecture on stepping motors, one on digital analog conversion, a two-line display on and analog to digital conversion, where we did a little um, pulse generator. And for this pulse generator, we actually needed the, the oscilloscope. Now documentation. As I said, documentation is one of the things that was very, uh, very much considered right from the beginning of the course. It should contain everything that needs to be known about the sensors, so the ten sensor data sheets, for example, the lecture slides, the exercise sheets, and the solutions, and links to additional documentation. It should be very easy to provide and easy to modify, and the students should be able to actually provide their own doc if they want to. So let me just try to click on this here and see if that is going to work. But this is not the documentation of, the, of this one course. And if you have a look, you see here, actually, I'm talking to a machine that is sitting in Ghana. So the, the whole, this tricky uh, documentation is hosted in Ghana. And here you see now, for example, if you have a look at the lecture slide, you see all the lecture slides of the 12 lectures, right? So if you go into one of these, you will see all, all the slides that were that were presented during during this lecture. Now, one of the big problems we had with the, with the sensor kit, for example, and actually with most of the sensors, now the sensors we essentially all bought directly in China. And the problem with this is that you get the sensors, like this here is the sensor kit, but there is absolutely no documentation whatsoever. Okay? And so that, of course, is a problem. And what I had to do is to actually go into one of these devices here. You see, I did myself um, a reverse engineering of the different boards, and I produced myself the, the schematic diagrams and the description of the different boards. So like this, you have all the information that is needed to actually run the, the course. Now, if anybody of you is interested in this course, you have access to this, you have access to the slides, you have access to the exercises, you have access to the programs, you can download them, you can try them on your own hardware if you want to do so. So if you don't mind, maybe we have a, a question from Said, which could be uh, interesting as well, looking at uh, this step. So is it, is it okay, Said, if you ask him? Mindy, I don't know, and maybe as well, Dora's reply. I think it could be a, a good question for both. So I let you speak. So do you have a good um, a good microphone, Said? Yes, yes, I do. Wonderful. So please go ahead. I think it's very important, your question, yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I was just wondering that aside electronics, are there any other aspect of physics where Arduino is very, very useful? For me, is there? I mean, aside electronics, aside electronics in physics, are there any other aspect of physics where Arduino is very useful? Well, I mean, the, the Arduino you, you, you can use and in, in, any, in any science if you want. What you need is, is all, all the Raspberry Pi, uh, it, it's the same thing. So what you need is the, the corresponding sensor or equations, okay? So you can actually even use it in industry. So if you have access to, I don't know, for example, um, interfaces that allow you to run a machine, then you can run this machine from one of these devices, okay? So let's say, for example, in uh, what uh, what they do in, in Ghana, they are thinking about using these these devices for um, for agriculture. So one of the students uh, built a, a hatching device for chickens. Okay, so he has got a, a mechanics 
that allows him to turn the X. It has uh, it has got a sensor that keeps the the, the temperature always constant, and uh, this is essentially what he needs for his hatching device. And uh, he can do it with this uh, with this control uh, with this control electronics much much cheaper than the than the uh, commercial devices that otherwise you could buy. Does this answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Right. Now, it was actually foreseen that we started the course in March, March 2017. And I have my shopping list of all the different hardware that we needed ready by September. And I bought my kit for preparation myself and I got it in January. So what I asked the university is to send me an official written invitation with all the, all the conditions of this job. Now by, by mid-February, there were no orders were made by the university and I had no invitation. So what we did, we decided to postpone the course to September. Now, when you do such a thing, you postpone a course, then immediately it means that any action on this is going to stop. And this is what happened. So by June, still no invitation, still no order, but I had an invitation to lecture the CERN School of Accelerators, which also took place in September. So I told the university by mid June I, I need the invitation, otherwise I will not come and I will go to the, to the accelerator school. Now actually, just two hours before the limit, I got an email where everything, where uh, it said that everything was settled. The only problem was that department head was not there. And uh, so he would send the invitation the next week. But in fact, it took another two or three weeks before finally I got the invitation. But without, uh, without the conditions. So I took the invitation and I went to the Ghanaian embassy in Lima to get my visa. And in fact, uh, the, the guys at the uh, embassy, they asked me if I was really sure about the authenticity of the invitation. So it seems that they didn't really trust their compatriots there. Now, two weeks before departure, there was still no hardware and still no order. Okay, I said, uh, now I have my flight ticket, I have my visa, I have everything, now I have to go. Even if the hardware is not there, we have to see then how we can somehow arrange things. And I sent my flight tickets to the university. And uh, shortly after, I get an answer from them saying that, no, I could only come for two months and that's all, not for four because of budget restrictions. Now, of course, I, I had prepared everything for four months. In addition, I calculated that it will take at least one month to get the equipment. And uh, so it meant that I would have less than one month to actually work on the Raspberry Pi for the course. And that simply made no sense. So what I did, I sent an email to my friend, me, and the fourth department head and telling them about the trouble. And, uh, and so the, the story actually went up, up to the university's vice chancellor, so the highest possible uh, uh, office. And finally, I got the okay from them for the dates officially foreseen. Now, end of August, there was a departure and still, still no hardware. Well, the last two times that I was in Africa, I was promised to be picked up at the airport and nobody showed up. Now, I was very happy that this time actually worked. So the local lecturer, his name is Ike. Now, now after several months of working together, actually he's not, not just a colleague, but a friend. And so he and his wife came and picked me up with a driver from the university. And they took me to the university guest house in Accra for the night. And I, I arrived in Accra late afternoon, so that was actually the best thing to do. Because it's about a four hour, three to four hours drive to go to Accra. The next day we visited T at his company, and then we continued to Cape Coast. Now arrive, arriving in Cape Coast, as I said, the uh, equipment was not there, but the promised housing was also not there. So I was set up in the university guest house. Now here you see my friend, me, 
and uh, myself tr about 20 or 30 years after the first photograph I showed you where the course were, was, was given in Ghana, the ICTP course. Now this is how the department looks like. Now here, this here is the, the School of uh, Agriculture and Nat Natural Sciences. So this is where the computing department is in. Now the, the lecture hall was somewhere up here and on the left hand side, you see it here, this was the office building and I had my office somewhere here in the second floor. Now here you see Ike at work. We had 20 PCs in the lab and out of the 20 PCs, four or five did not work at all. And the others had completely heterogeneous operating systems. So you found Windows XP, Windows 7, you found different Linux uh, distributions of all the different ages and so on. So the, the lab as it was, to my mind, it was simply unusable. But we had the uh, permission to erase all the disks and to start from scratch. And this is actually what we did. So we installed the newest Ubuntu Linux system on all of the PCs. We took out the four that worked and we ended up with about 15 working stations. Okay, so Ike is the one who was supposed and is taking over the lab after my departure. So now we start with the first lecture. There are still no microcontrollers and no order yet. So the, the only thing I could do was actually to start with Linux, the operating system, showing how to, to work with it, and a little bit of C programming. Well, we had a preliminary meeting where we decided that we would start our lectures at 9 GMT. And when I was there in the lecture hall at 9, 9 GMT, I was alone. And uh, well, at 9.30 or so, the first students came in and at about 10 or so, we were complete. And uh, well, the students told me, well, Ghana and time, and Ghana man time means, well, you come in when, whenever you think it's, it's time to come. Now you can imagine that for some, a German who has been working in Switzerland for 35 years, this is a little bit difficult. Another difficulty I found that that was the, the knowledge of, our, of my students in programming. So these were students in computer science in the third year. And I expected that they had computing courses and they would know at least the basics of, of, uh, of programming. So I asked them what sort of programming courses they had. And they told me they had a one semester C++ course. So I thought, okay, then it's, it's pretty simple because uh, C is a subset of C++, so I should easily be able to, to write simple C programs. But it turned out they were actually unable to align 10 or 20 lines of C++ code. And I asked them how this was possible after a whole semester of course. And then they told me, well, they had the course was with about 100 other students in a big lecture hall. And the professor was on the whiteboard and he wrote his program on the whiteboard. The exercises were done on paper and they had to hand in the paper with their, with their solutions. But they never had actually written a, a program on the computer and tested it. So for me, this was all really quite difficult. And after a week, after the first week, there was still no lab. And Ike has had one Raspberry Pi, I had one, so we could equip two stations. That was it. So we asked around at the university if we could find another, a few other Raspberry Pis that we could borrow. And actually we found five in the uh, physics department, but these had no power supplies. So they were somewhere in the drawer lying there and that's it. Okay, so really it was extremely difficult for me and I, I sent a, a mail back to my colleagues at CERN and I told them about what was happening to me. And one of my CERN friends sent me this advice here. He said, no matter how tremendous an obstruction may appear at a distance, you will see that if you go on in a certain way, it will disappear as you approach it, or there will be a way over, through, or around it. 
kind of in fact before the miracle there was a, a festival now the biggest festival a folkloric festival in ghana actually and this was very very nice so i went to see the the festival but it also had a nefast um, side effect and that was that uh, my room in the guest house was occupied by somebody else so it was reserved and so i went to the uh, to the department head and i told him look if I don't uh, get a room by Saturday, then I need a tent. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, what can I do? And so very quickly, it, uh, it turned out that the, the room was then available and uh, I got me some bed sheets and stuff. You see, it's a rather simple room, just a bed, a chair and a table. And that's about it. But there's not much more than that I needed. And then the miracle actually appeared. So this is what my CERN uh, colleague was talking about. So after a week and over a beer, I discussed with me and he said, look, I will give you a thousand US dollars to start the lab. And the next day, the university released the budget for the lab and the supplier in China actually said, well, he can uh, deliver immediately. And two weeks later, he had the material. So here you see the boxes. After I had uh, brought them through the customs in, in Accra, which again was uh, not a simple affair. So now bringing up the Raspberry, uh, bringing up the Raspberry Pi. The operating system distribution, the basic one is called Raspbian, which is a Linux distribution based on Debian. And it's a distribution made for the ARM processors. It's distributed in zip format, so you download the, the zip file to your PC, you unzip it, and what you get is a raw image with two partitions. Now this raw image you can take as it is and copy it with the Unix DD command, disk to disk copy. Now what this, this does, it takes byte per byte and copies it from the uh, PC disk to the SD card, okay? And then you install the SD card in the slot of the Raspberry Pi and you try to boot. Now, when doing this DD command, you have to be extremely careful because if you get the device wrong to which you copy, then you may actually overwrite your hard disk on the PC and then of course nothing works anymore. But we managed to get the, the correct, uh, correct uh, SD card. We tried to boot the system and luckily it worked as expected. So then the system comes up and the first thing that we have to do is to update it to the very latest versions of all the different uh, programs with APT, which is the advanced package tool. After that, you have a program that is called Raspi config, which allows you to configure all the different drivers. So for the general purpose IO, for I2C, the camera, SPI, and so on. Then you have to create the user accounts the administrator account, configure the network, and we did all this on with a monitor and the USB keyboard and mouse connected directly onto the Raspberry Pi. Okay, so once we had that, then we wanted to bring out the Raspberry Pi and connect it to the network so that we can actually access it from a PC and we do not need the uh, the the hardware, the, so the screen, the, the keyboard and the mouse in order to run, to run the Raspberry Pi. Now in the lab, we had enough switches, but we didn't have enough network plugs and also we didn't have enough cables. So what we had to do during the weekend, over two days, we installed all the network plugs, plugs in the lab, we cabled everything up to the switches. We provided fixed IP addresses for all the Raspberry Pis so that they are easily accessible for many PC. And then you can, once you have done this, then you can take away the, uh, the keyboard, the directly connected keyboard and the, the monitor, and you access the Raspberry Pi from the PC, either through SSH or through a remote desktop, okay? Now we're working, we were working on this configuration literally until the last second before it was actually needed in the course. So in order to access the Raspberry Pi remotely, 
Well, we have these different possibilities. Either you, you run the remote desktop. In order to do that, you have to enable a VNC server on the Raspberry Pi. And then you have a remote desktop client on the PC and you can connect to it. Or you can use the secure shell from a terminal and then you connect to the, to the Raspberry Pi through SSH. If you give the option minus X, then you have you can actually use your PC as an terminal and all your different programs that you have on the Raspberry Pi will be displayed on your PC. You can copy files with SCP from the PC to the Raspberry Pi or back. And if you want, you can even use uh, NFS to, to run to, uh, on, on the Raspberry Pi to, to get disk access for, on the PC. So this is how the remote desktop will look like. So in fact, this is the desktop of the Raspberry Pi. And this is how the SSH will look like. So here I've got a terminal, I connect it to SSH, and uh, then I can run here my programs on the Raspberry Pi. So let me try to do that straight online. So here I have actually a Raspberry Pi, which Hopefully it's running, let me see, uh, it should be running. So let me see if I take, um, this here is the, the desktop client. Okay, here I say I want to connect to the Raspberry, Raspberry Pi. Now I have to give the password. And what you see here, now this is actually the screen that I have on my Raspberry Pi. Here you see this, this actually says it's a Raspberry Pi. If I say the, this here, the operating system, you see it's a, a Raspberry Pi operating system. Now, if I run, for example, if I want to run an editor here, right, you see the editor comes up and I can program my programs. So that is one of the possibilities how you can access your Raspberry Pi. Now the second one is using a terminal like we have here, and this is what we usually did actually. So you say SSH minus X Raspberry Pi. Now actually the Raspberry Pi, this is a host name, and what you find behind it is the IP address of this Raspberry Pi. Again, you give the password and you are on the Raspberry Pi, okay? And here I can go, for example, these are a few programs that I've prepared for this course that I will show you in a minute. So this is now running on the Raspberry Pi. Now let me go back to my slides. Okay, now the first exercise is on the Raspberry Pi. Now the Raspberry Pi actually looks very, very similar to uh, the Ubuntu on the, on the PC. And the students, they will compile and try their programs directly on the Pi. So you don't have to do it on the PC, but you can store the program directly on the SD card of the Raspberry Pi. And when copying, well, when copying in the binary, but if you compile a program on the PC and you copy over the binary to the Raspberry Pi, then this program is not going to work. We'll see in a, in a minute. And in fact, the, uh, well, we have two different processes. You have an Intel processor on the PC, you have an ARM processor on the Raspberry Pi. So in order to write a program on the PC and to run it on the Pi, you have to cross-compile it on the PC but it is much easier for, at least for, for the students at the beginning to do no native compilation and to do it directly on the Pi. The first program that anybody will learn, uh, who has learned C, uh, C, will have seen right at the very beginning, and this is the world famous Hello World program. So even if you don't know C, I think you will understand what, what this does. Okay, here we have got, uh, well, this is the comment. We include the standard I.O. library, 
And here is our main program, which does nothing more than printing Hello World. Now, this, in fact, on a standard embedded system, on a small embedded system, this can become quite complex because this needs uh, a serial line. You need to configure the UART and you need to have some sort of serial terminal emulator on your PC to, re to receive the Hello World that is printed. So this can be quite quite complicated on on a small embedded system. Now on a system like uh, on the Raspberry Pi, this is different because you have, as I said, a full-blown uh, computer. Now the Hello World program, is the equivalent is in the embedded systems with a blinking LED. Now let me try again first to see. Let's go back here. And I said here we are on the Raspberry Pi. So if I go, well, let me, let me pick up the Hello World program, which is this one. So you see, again, including the, uh, the standard I.O. library, and then printing out Hello World. That is all that is done. Now, what we did in the course is that we always tried to produce make files. Now, make files are, are files that actually describe what needs to be done in order to compile the program. Now, the make file for this program is extremely simple. Essentially, it says, all oh, hello world, hello. So this, this, says, this says, all that is need to be done is to compile hello. And then this stuff here is to, comp to clean any, any uh, uh, secondary programs that, that, that are created when, when you do the compilation or when you do the editing. Okay. So how would we now actually compile this program and how would we run it? So let me see. What we need to do is to simply say make. Now this is the compilation. You see it says, the C compiler, take the, the source code, which is hello.c, and the output is hello. Now, you see we have a new program, hello, that has been created. Let me do it once more. If I do a make clean, you see the hello is gone. If I do a make, the hello is recreated. And if I start it, it prints hello world. Okay, so this is how you do program development on, on the Raspberry Pi. So it looks exactly the same that you would do on the, on the PC. Now, if you want to access external hardware, so for example, the simplest thing that we can do is to access an LED. Now, what needs to be done to make this thing work? The first thing we need is to set up the hardware. So we have to connect the LED the cathode, the, the actually the, the, anode, the, the anode is uh, it, the, the other way around. Oops. The, the anode we have to connect to a GPIO pin. We have to put the cathode via ground to a 30, 330 ohms resistor. And then we have to, to write the software to actually light this LED. And the software, now this can again be rather complex. But there are libraries available which allow you to, uh, to well, which have functions that you call to very easily do access to our external hardware. So we can program through this library our GPI open to be output. And then we can write the GPI open to switch the LED on or off. We delay for a few milliseconds and then we can write the, the other uh, the other state, so once on, once off, and like this, the thing is going to blink. So this is our LED. This is the schematic diagram. So here you would have a, a GPIO pin that you connect. If you put this pin to one, which is 3.3 volts, then you will have, because of the 330 ohms, you will have 10 milliamps flowing through the LED and the LED to light. If you put a zero here, GPIO pin zero, then this gets to zero level. This is at zero level and the thing will, will be switched off. 
So in order to get access to this GPIO pin, I already told you we have got this cobbler, this thing. This is the, the Raspberry Pi. The cobbler and the Raspberry Pi are connected through this cable. And this thing here then goes into, onto a breadboard. And here we have got our GPIO pin, which then we can connect to our LED. For the library, there are different libraries available. What we are using is a library called PyGPIO. And this PyGPIO uh, library um, gives us access to, well, to, to the different GPIO pins through library calls. Now, in fact, the way it does it is that it runs a so-called daemon. So this is a program, oops, uh, three years. This is a program that is uh, running permanently. And this program actually does the hardware access. It is called from the library. And it is done that way because normally if you do have hardware access, then this is only allowed to be done by the super user. Now, in order to have a normal user access to external hardware, you, you do not do the access directly, but you pass through this PyGPIO daemon this one has been started by the super user. So a normal user can then via the library and via the, the GPIO daemon access the external hardware. Now this is how, how you would uh, use it. You have to include this file here, which is delivered with the library. This is how you have to compile it. And as you see, you have, this is your program. So you have this is your, your C program, this is the output. And this here, this here is the library, and this is an, an additional library that is needed. And then you can simply run the program saying dot slash prog. Now, these are the library calls. So what we need to do, first we have to set up the system, actually start it. So we do it with PyGPIO start. Then we have to set the mode of our GPIO so we would set it to output. And then we have to write in order to write uh, to, to get the, the signal level on our GPIO signal. All right. So let's try to have a look again how this looks like. Here. LED. Oops. Right. So I said we have to include this, this include file. This you see here. Now my LED is connected to pin 18. So the LED corresponds to 18. Off is 0, on is 1. And then we do the PI GPIO start, which we, we, we saw just now. Now this will give the connection to the daemon. We have to set the mode and we have to set it to output. And then finally, we write our pin on and we, we wait for half a second and we write it off again. Like this, our, our LED should be blinking. So let me see. Again, as you can see, there is a make file to build this. Okay, so I build it. And I am on the, Ras on the Raspberry Pi here, as you can see. So let's try what happens if we do blink. And you see, this here is, this here is the, the cobbler. Okay, here in the back is the Raspberry Pi. This is the flat cable that I showed you. Here I've got my LED. It's very hard to see, but here is the, uh, is the resistor. And you see now the program actually makes the LED blink. Now, maybe you don't, you don't uh, believe me, no, so that this is actually the program. So let's try to change it and let's have it blink slower. So now we sleep for one second. We make it again. And I think it, 
Now you see it's by a factor of two slower. Okay. So, so this is the way that you would ac access external hardware. Now there are of course not only LEDs, there are different devices, and there are different devices you can actually access the same way. Here we have got a temperature and humidity sensor where you have got ground, VCC, and one data line. So again, this one data line is connected to one of the GPIO lines, as we have, have seen just now. So in order to make a measurement, you program your GPIO line first to output. You pull it down for a certain amount of time. You release it. And then once you again wait a little bit of time, and from that moment onward, you actually switch your GPIO from output to input and you start reading. And then you read the state of the line every few microseconds. So this must be actually very, very fast. And then what you, what you will get, you save the state of the, the signal that is sent by the data line of the HD11. And you, you keep that. So this is how it will look like. Okay. So this is the signal that comes back from the THD11 once you have started a measurement. And once, one thing you see very, very easily is that there are signals that are long, like these ones, these ones, and this one. Now the long signals, these are ones, and all the short signals, these are zeros. So now you need a program to actually figure out which of the signals are long and which of the signals are short. And then each of these signals here corresponds to one bit. And then this one bit will allow you to, to get at the data. In this, in this case, it's going to be temperature and humidity data. Okay, so this is going to be a 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So that is one part of the, uh, of the temperature measurement. So that is one way to the GPIO. The other one is, for example, a stepping motor. Now, in a stepping motor, you will have four coils that you have to uh, power in a certain in a certain fashion, in a certain sequence. Now, instead of having a single GPIO line, as you can see, now we need four of them because we have got the four coils. And this is a driver here. And here you see the four pins that will go to the GPIO line. Now this here is connected to the stepping motor. And if you program it in such a way that you have a one on the first coil, then and all zeros on the other, then a one on the second coil and all zeros on the other, a one on the third and the zeros on the other and so on, then this here will actually move your stepping motor by four steps. So you do that repeatedly and your stepping motor is going to turn. Oops. Now, this is how it looks like when the students try to understand how this is working. So here they are about to, uh, to cable the, the stepping motor. Here you see the cable. Here you see the, 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 the breadboard. And once it was cabled, then they had to write the program to, to run this thing. Well, this, this is the the way that you would access hardware with simple GPIO lines. Now we have a different uh, possibilities now for different types of, of devices. So there are certain devices that use interface buses. And a very typical such instrumentation bus is called the I2C bus. Now, how does this work? The I2C bus is actually a master slave bus. So you have a master, in this case, the microcontroller, which has got an interface. And this interface will have a total of four, uh, four signals. You have a VCC and ground, and you have a clock, and you have got a data signal. Now, in order to access one of these, of these devices here, now each of these devices here are actually sensors or actuators that you can control via this I2C bus. And each of these devices have got their own address. 
So the way you access it is that the master sends a 7-bit address. So you can have a total of 128 of these devices here on the bus, followed by a read lock write line. And the slave that has the address that the master was asking for will then answer. Okay. So either it will, it will take the data into control or it will send back data to, to do the acquisition. Now, a typical, uh, a typical example of this is the IO expander. And this was used on the, uh, on the uh, display. So here you have got a two line display. And you see on the back of the display, you have this little board here, which is a nice classy board. If you look very closely, you see SDA and SCL, VCC and ground. So these are just the four signals that are connected to, uh, to our breadboard and to our Raspberry Pi. And this thing here is essentially a sort of a shift register. So instead of sending all the data that are needed for the display in a parallel uh, fashion, and you see there are plenty of them. So you have D D0 to D7, you have a register select, read, write, and so on. So normally you have to send all these signals and connect them all up. Now, instead of doing that, you have here the I2C device. So you send the data serially. This is a shift register and out comes the parallel data, which are then put onto these pins here. So that saves you a lot of, of cabling. And this is how it looks like in the end. Now here we have a little meteor station, as I said. This is the THT11 I was talking about. It measures temperature and humidity. So in gamma at that time was 35 degrees Celsius with 58% uh, relative humidity. And this was the air pressure. And this here was data actually taken in the lab. And again, you see temperature and humidity and this is quite interesting to see. You see it's 34 degrees, you see. And all of a sudden, it drops down to, well, to 19 degrees. Do you have any idea why this is the case? Well, the reason is very simple. At that moment, the air condition was switched on. OK, and here what you see, this is actually the control cycle of the air condition. And then at a certain moment, we switch the air condition off and slow, and the uh, and the temperature went up to 32, 32 degrees again at night. And you see that the uh, that the relative humidity sort of follows more or less the same trend. So this was taken over I don't know several several hours with the program I just showed you. So the exercises that we did, well maybe we can actually have a look also on on the I square C bus. Let's see. Because what I did, I, I also connected a, an I square C device, a BME 680, which is also, well, which is the, the uh, successor of the barometric uh, pressure sensor that I, I showed you before. So this is a little bit a more modern uh, uh, device which can do a little bit more also. So now the problem with these devices is that there it is not as simple as just sending a, uh, a bit on and send or sending a bit off. But these devices have plenty of different registers. And so you usually need to read a data sheet of 50 or 60 pages to understand how exactly the device is working. So what I did was to write a library, which is, uh, let me see. Well, this here is, is the library. And then this library will give access to, again, very simple functions that the, uh, that the students can use. And in our case, if you have a look how this looks like, Now you see again, we have got an include file, which describes more or less the library. And these, are, these here are the different library calls that allow you to access the, the, the device. OK. 
Okay. Now you see there are quite a few more than uh, than just the the, the blinking LED. But if I try to run this thing here, let's let me see. Per perhaps if I have it. No, I didn't. I didn't copy it. Okay, it doesn't matter. Ah, yes. What we can try is to find out the, which devices are on the on the bus. So I think it's called uh, I square C I square C detect. It's called. So what I do there, I ask the system to tell me which are the I square C devices that are connected to bus one. And you see, there is one. These are all the different possibilities of addresses, I square C addresses. You see there is a single device which is, which is connected to address 77. Okay. And now if I run my little program, I think it's this one. Now you see in my book here, we have 24 degrees at the moment. And well, the, the air pressure is pretty low, so they say probably tomorrow it's going to rain. And uh, this here is the humidity. So measured in direct uh, during this, this lecture here. OK, so in the course, these were the different uh, exercises that we did on the hardware. LEDs, as I showed you, stepping motors, the DHT11, the biometric pressure sensor, the LCD display. So we wrote a few programs to send some text to the LCD display. The digital to analog converter to create a signal level, to create a sign, a sawtooth, rectangular, and triangular signals. And we had a look at these with the oscilloscope that I showed you before. Then we have an analog to digital converter to read a potentiometer. We have a real time clock and a right. So these were the devices. Okay, the, the devices we had, the 8-bit analog to digital converter with a potentiometer, thermistor, photoresistor on board, the digital to analog converter for the pulse form and the LCD and the barometric pressure sensor. Okay, so let me say that as a summary, well, I think I can say that uh, after initial, uh, initial difficulties, the course actually went very well. Well, we had something like uh, 20, 25 students at, at the beginning, but uh, when the students found out that there's actually quite a bit of work behind it to really understand what is happening, uh, what to, to write the programs, to debug the programs, and so on. So the number dropped to about 15. This is what we needed, really. Now, the course was repeated by IT in 2018, but without any updates. So I was actually hoping that I could develop the course, perhaps use new, uh, new sensors or try, try other sensors and integrate this into the course. But uh, this actually didn't happen. Well, he also said that he wanted to, um, to, port the, to port the whole course onto the Python language instead of C, because he said that, oops, uh, no. Because he said that uh, at UCC, Python was more common than, than C, which I find a little strange in a, in a computing, uh, uh, computing department. I would have thought that in a computing department, the C language or C++ language is a must for all of the students. And Python is a very nice thing to, to learn in addition. But OK, this, this, is, uh, this is what he said. And in fact, one of the lecturers, also one of the lecturers of the department I was talking to, uh, he wanted to to come and also have a look uh, in you know what the course was actually all about, how the how the exercises looked like and so on, and participate, and learn a bit about it. 
But uh, after two or three sessions, he told me, well, look, uh, C language is a challenge for me. And I mean, if C language is a challenge for me, in my case, I would take up the challenge and see, okay, very nice, I can learn something new. But for him, it meant, well, no, I, I better don't do it, which I think is quite a bit of a pity. Okay. So in general, I can say that uh, the lecture sessions, of which we had a few, didn't really work out. The lectures came, but they all, uh, some lectures came, very few of them, and they only came very sporadically, and not very much has happened. Uh, happened. Also, as I said, I hope that I could actually develop the course further, maybe do the, uh, do the port to the Python language. Well, I started to do that in the last uh, two weeks that I was at uh, the Univers University of Cape Coast. Having no clue by, about Python programming, I mean, this was the very first uh, Python programs I ever wrote. But you will see that the next course that uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, well, at least having I give in, in, uh, in Cape Coast, that one will be based on Python. So I will talk about it in a week's time from now. Okay. Now, the problem was, to my mind, that after I left the course, actually no progress happened in the lab any further. So that is a bit of a pity. The other thing that didn't work, to my mind, that was that we wanted to, prom to promote the course to other African universities. And this also, for the moment, without success. The idea being that if you do so, then the people in these universities could actually collaborate. And uh, then if one of the university develops some programs or some uh, pro projects on one or the other center, then the other university could, could profit and uh, you know, they, they could discuss and, uh, and solve problems mutually. But for the moment, this also has not happened. So what we have is a course that is completely finished, where you have got all the documentation where you, uh, where you get the programs, you can have access to it, you can also modify it if you want. So everything is open source. And um, so up to you, if anybody is interested to, to continue with this. Now the university, they have every year, they have got an open day. And uh, during that open day, the, uh, the students they show off projects that they have done during their studies. So this is quite a huge thing. The, all, the, all the different departments in the university are there and uh, even TV is coming and uh, is, is then uh, filming what, what the students have done and showing it in the evening in the news. Okay, and so we had to prepare uh, for the open day a few, a few projects. Now, unfortunately, the open day came a little bit early. It came uh, after a month or so that I was there, so the students were not yet actually up to the level that they could present their own, their own projects. So I had to help them quite a lot to, to do that. And these were the projects that we had. So we had a simulation of traffic lights. So you had uh, two, two streets with uh, two traffic lights and uh, it simply switched then the green from one, from one street to the other and back in the normal, you know, uh, red, uh, yellow, green uh, sequence. Okay, that was one of the programs. The second program was uh, was on the on the display on the LCD display. So we had the uh, the visitor at the open day type in his name, and then he would be welcomed on the LCD screen. So it will it would say welcome to, and then the name would be printed on the LCD screen. Then we had a stepping motor program where we could control the stepping motor, move it forward, backward, different speeds, half, half step uh, or full step. We had a volt meter and we had this small meteorological station where, um, where we measure air temperature, pressure and humidity. And finally, we had a small obstacle avoiding robot, which you see here. Okay, so this thing here is actually based on the uh, on an Arduino, 
and you can it, it runs on its own. So you switch so you switch the uh, the Arduino on. It will measure the distance between itself and any obstacle using ultrasonic distance measurements, which, which is this here. If you find an obstacle, then it will look left and right because this thing is mounted onto a servo motor. And then it will step, step back and run into the direction where there is most space available. So this is how the, the, the robot looked like. If you buy it in pieces, so this is the, the chassis. You have got two uh, DC motors, the wheels, which are mount, mounted here onto the DC motors. This is the Arduino Uno. This here is a shield that you put on top, which allows you to easily connect all to the different to the different GPIO lines, etc. Now this one is a motor driver for the DC motor. Here the servo motor, and here you have got the uh, the ultrasonic uh, distance measurement, and and uh, the batteries because the the thing actually runs on battery. Now again, the the total cost of the robot, as you see it here is about 20 euros. Now this includes the, the chassis, the wheels, the motors, the controller, everything. Okay. Right, and this is how it looks like in detail. So here you see the motor. In fact, what you can also do here, it has got an encoder. So, and if you have an extra hardware, which is put on top here, now this is an LED and a photoresistor. So you can measure the speed of the motor using this, this encoder. And you have a second one here. And like this, you can make sure that the, the two motors run at exactly the same speed so that the, the robot always go, goes exactly straight. So this is the, the, uh, the motor driver connected to the controller. As I said, the, this is the shield. So the, uh, the connector shield and the, the Arduino fits simply under it. Well, here you see uh, the ultrasonic uh, distance measurement. And these devices here, these are uh, Bluetooth devices. And in fact, you, have, you can write a second program where you can then control your, the running of your robot, for example, with your smartphone via, via Bluetooth. So you can have it like, you know, one of these uh, RC controlled uh, racing cars. And you can control the, the, the speed. You can control the direction using uh, using Bluetooth. Okay, I think the hour is more or less over. So let me see if there are if there are questions. Just thanks a lot to Lee for this uh, very complete uh, hands-on uh, on online uh, presentation. So it's quite interesting to see the concept as well of uh, showing how all those things can be done in a laboratory, but as well using online presentation. So hopefully, so they will be, it will as well give a lot of ideas and then by having everything recorded, we can repeat it as well in different places. Assuming perhaps, the hard one, available. perhaps let me show you one thing. Uh, how do I, how do I get, stop share the screen? Yeah, okay. So what I can show you here is this is what I will do next week. Mm -hmm. uh, here you see a, a little, well, these, these, are, these are actually not one board, but these are three boards. So you have a, a little baseboard like this one, onto which you can put a CPU, like that one, and you can put all sorts of, a, uh, of uh, the sensors and uh, and actuators, right, right onto these, uh, onto these, um, what do you call it? Well, they call it a, a triple, a triple baseboard. Okay, and you do it actually a bit like you do, you do it with Legos. So you just plug it in, and once it's plugged in, all the connections are made. Now this is really, really neat, right? Mm -hmm. This is the 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 new actually what the new course is based on. This CPU here is so powerful. I mean, it's, it's, this is the one that I showed you that cost you five, five and a half euros, but it's so powerful that you can actually run a Python interpreter right on this, on this chip. Mm -hmm. okay? And this is what we're going to do in a week's time. Now, 
here I have got a whole series of these of these different boards, and I have a, a GPS mo a GPS module. I have a well, I have a display module. I have a, well, I don't remember it now by heart. You will see it next week. And this is the whole system, everything included, with the CPU, the baseboard, all the sensors, the stepping motors, the DC motor, uh, the servo motor, the displays, everything in five or 35 euros. 35 plus the shipping cost, I guess. That's what Inclu might be. <laughs> including shipping. Including the shipping in Africa, question? Uh, yes, I mean, we actually got it into Africa. Uh -huh. and, and the price was, well, these, these, these ones, of course, I, I bought for myself here. Mm. But uh, Ike has already bought all the equipment that we need for the new course. And he, it's, all, it's all in Ghana already. Exactly. So the only problem we have now is that he has to do the work to actually go through all the exercises and, um, you know, and understand them himself before we were able to, uh, to, to keep the course. Very good. Very good. So maybe this is question as well for, for our um, students. So, so are there any of you who have been using uh, so any of those uh, Raspberry Pi and maybe as well flow some of the courses while we were as well at the IDSP? Anybody want to, to ask question or to share as well the experience uh, with uh, those type of hardware? And Said was uh, so you you were indeed uh, um, asking in terms of which application, and I think this is one of the important point as well to motivate it with some application, and and it was really nice to see all the different sensors and all the different kits. So there is a lot that can be done somehow while thinking in terms of a robot. This is only a very small subset of everything that you can have. Yeah. So I mean, just just for fun. But if we think on, um, yeah. You, you see, this is a box full of different sensors, right? So, and, and I mean, I was I was invited two years ago to the uh, what is it called? The AIS. It's called the African Internet Summit to give a, a two-day workshop on uh, on IoT. And one of the, the questions that the student asked me uh, was more or less the same. So what are the applications? Mm -hmm. And so my answer was, the application is your application. Yeah, but, so but often want, it, it's good to, to, to give some picture so that then it can drive some other type of ideas that, uh, that they yeah. could look at. So I think that this is something that could be good to, I mean, think maybe as well for next week. And, and to bring as well some, some capacity. Because indeed, as soon as you speak about stepper motor, there's so many applications using stepper motor right away. So that's one of the big things. But then when you think in terms of Africa, you gave some good example. I think this is one of those things that we need to think of as well for the agriculture side, because it, it's always some as well simple model. So how complex can we go? Maybe, of course, it's just depending on how, how much uh, interface there are. But as well, for instance, when you think about connecting with anything as a source of energy for bigger equipment, so like, for instance, with the photovoltaic, so trying to find ways as well to, 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 to connect, uh, and, and then everything which is in remote, so that's also very powerful. So I think it really can open to many, many, many type of activities, just as well, you this, said. This little device, actually, I mean, you... I think I can show you even. You have a, you, you see the this white little thing here. Mm -hmm. Under that, this is actually a battery connection. Okay, so you can run it with a 3.6 volt battery, and it will last for quite a long time. You you can also use a, a, photo, a photovoltaic. Uh, uh, That's for instance for the sustainability. It could be and cool. run it on that. Yeah. Yeah. Our con concerning applications, I mean, we have some very, very funny, strange applications. You know, one, one of the, the problems that the farmers have in Ghana is that they cow, their cows, they go just about anywhere. 
because uh, there is no, you know, there are no fences and so on, so they just go. And of course, they also go into the fields of farmers which, uh, which uh, grow vegetables. And uh, these farmers are not very happy about these cows. And so the idea was we have to figure out somehow to, to uh, see, to give, a, give a program uh, so that the farmer can see where his cows are. Okay, so the idea is we have on one of the lead cow, we put a GPS module and we observe him and see where he goes. Mm -hmm. And like this, the farmer always knows where his cows are. And if they get too close to, uh, to a field where there's vegetables, then they can come and pick up their cows and put them somewhere else, right? So this is one of the examples. The type of Another very strange example, uh, uh, one of the, the students once did, has to do with beans, with peas. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have uh, two twins in, uh, in one, in one uh, uh, how do you say, uh, well, one, one, one box, right? So if you have two, two of the, uh, uh, if a new queen has been born, then there will be sort of a quarrel between the old queen and the new queen, uh, the, the, the old queen and the new bee queen. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the new queen will actually collect his, uh, the, the, his own uh, followers and one day or another will escape and will try to, to start so its, own, its own family, right? And then, of course, the, uh, the, the farmer who has the bees, he will lose that, that part of, uh, of his stock. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is, in fact, that just before they leave, the bees become very nervous. And so they make a lot of noise. So what the guys did, they put a microphone into, into their boxes. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the noise goes over a certain level, then they get an SMS saying, be careful, they are which are going to escape, right? So you see, projects are plenty. Yeah. So it depends really on the, on the person who, who wants to do the job. Very good, yeah, because indeed uh, all those, uh, I mean, it's a control system, huh? and, and this is really like any kind of interlock or any kind of alarm. Or, or, so, so then indeed maybe to run an accelerator, who knows? That's one of those things as well that we can think in terms of at least some little uh, additional tools that could be like very cheap and very flexible. So definitely that's an interesting thing. So, so it's, uh, and it doesn't require so much, uh, if, if you can get as well with, with Python, I think this is really one very good, it's an added value as well, because this is something very flexible and that could be definitely uh, applicable to, to many universities as well. So yeah, very good, very good. Good, and then this is what we'll know next time then. Huh? So this is very good. Excellent. And if there are any additional questions, so feel free to address them specifically, so directly to Uli or to, yeah. to next time. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Them. Yeah, my email address, did I put it on the slides? Uh, sure. Let me check uh, at the beginning. Uh, no, but no, uh, you, you, you still have the stand address, huh? correct? Pardon me? The one from Sean, does it still work? Oh, yes, you have it, sorry. It is there at gmail.com. Yes. Okay. It is on the website, so it's all fine. Perfect. And so if if uh, some of the students are interested and want to have a look at the thing, they can always have, I mean, this is, uh, this was given, let me see. No, I don't, it was the, the uh, tricky page is somewhere on the on the slides. As well on the slide, okay. Yeah. So you you simply go click onto this tricky page, and you will you will get all the information about the about the course, and actually you also get the information about the next course if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because uh, let me see if you go onto the tricky. Let me see. So you're looking at uh, the. Um... So I will, I will just uh, switch the. The share screen once more. So. No, it didn't work. Share screen. This one. Sh 
share. Okay. It will. So, so this is is the is the the, the tricky page, and this one is the course. Uh, this one is the course from 2017, which I was talking about today, and this one is the new course. So this is what I will be talking about uh, next week. You see, there are still a few things to be filled, which are not yet there, but the course itself is is entirely there. There are no slides, because uh, I I think that the lecturer is going is, is going to have to to write the slides. It's not my job. But the exercises and solutions are there, and uh, you also have a, a GitHub page, which I will show next time, from where you can download all the uh, all the different uh, programs. So you have the program as well available. Very good. Okay, excellent. So there's uh, some material as well to look at in advance. So. Okay. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Tuli, for your, your time, for your presentation, and thanks everybody as well for listening. And we'll see you next week. So the follow up. Yep. And, uh, see you then, and see you next week, maybe. Yes. Uh, stay safe. Yep. Cheers. Bye, Uli. Bye, everybody. Bye.